Thanks so much for being here. Um, pleasure to have you. This is really a wonderful panel this afternoon. Um, glad you're spending your lunchtime with us. Um, in the weeks leading up to the 2020 presidential campaign, FairVote will be conducting a series of virtual panels on the future of American elections. There is not a more timely topic, and we will be talking with some of the most visionary thinkers in the electoral reform space about how we create the kind of democracy that lives up to our highest ideals and the kind of nation we all want to live in. Looking ahead for just a moment, uh, we'd love to have you spend a little more time with us in our next events, uh, Tuesday, September 15th, when we'll hear from author Daniel Newman of How to Unrig, How to Fix Our Broken Democracy, as well as Catherine Giel of The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy, two of the most acclaimed titles of the year. Um, then at noon on October 1st, we'll hear from the brilliant Harvard political scientist and philosophy professor, Danielle Allen. More events to come, keep an eye on our social media spaces. I'm really excited for the conversation that we will have today. I'm going to pose the first two rounds of questions or so, and then we'll open it up to all of you watching. If you have questions you would like to ask, um, you're all experts on Zoom, I am sure by now. We've got Q&A and chat functions below. Go ahead and leave your questions in those fields at any time. Um, our staff is watching and monitoring and we will pose as many questions as we possibly can in the time that we have. Our three guests today approach the topic of electoral reform from three distinct but really fascinating perspectives. As a longtime lawmaker in a one-party state, as an independent candidate for office who literally ran against and up against a system in need of change, and one of the top election law experts in the nation who has thought deeply about the flaws in the system, but also more importantly, perhaps also chronicled the inspiring state and local reform victories that can leave us all feeling optimistic about possibilities of what we can accomplish together. Their starting places may be different, but I think what's really interesting about this panel today is that they all end in a pretty similar place. So I want to welcome Rebecca chavez Hauk, a former Utah State representative who holds a BA in journalism and a master's of public administration, both from the University of Utah. She represented District 24, Salt Lake City, and the Utah House of Representatives from 2008 through 2018, focusing on public policy related to health and human services, as well as voter engagement and access. Neil Simon is a retired business executive and former independent candidate for a U.S. Senate seat in Maryland. He is the author of a terrific book, The Contract to Unite America, 10 Reforms to Reclaim Our Republic, which recounts stories from campaigns around the country, including his own, and provides specific and practical solutions for improving our government. Josh Douglas is a professor at the University of Kentucky, the J. David Rosenberg College of Law there. He teaches and researches election law and voting rights, civil procedure, constitutional law, and judicial decision-making. He is the author of another wonderful book, Vote for Us, How to Take Back Our Elections and Change the Future of Voting, a popular press book that provides hope and inspiration for the positive path forward on voting rights that we so dearly need. Um, so welcome, everybody. Thank you again for joining us. Um, Neil, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Um, you ran as an independent for the US Senate in Maryland. You experienced all of this firsthand, and you write profoundly about the way in which our current is, our current system really incentivizes politicians to behave um, in in certain ways that um, I think we'd all like to see changed. Um, how would the future of American elections and those incentives look different? You think if we used ranked choice voting? Thank you, Dave, and it's great to be with you and with Josh and Rebecca. Um, when I ran for office, what I found was a system that in every way encouraged me to 
go after one of the two bases. It encouraged me to join a blue team or a red team and appeal to the base of one of those parties. And it has to do with the way districts are drawn, which you've written so eloquently about, has, the way, has to do with the way our primaries work, has to do with the way money works, ballot access, debates, the whole system really pushes you as a candidate to choose a team and appeal to one of the bases of the parties and then use that as a channel to, to be elected into office. Um, ranked choice voting could really do a lot to change that dynamic. And it's that dynamic that causes the polarization and the dysfunction that so many of us are so tired of. And I think ranked choice voting does it really in, in three different ways. First is you eliminate the spoiler argument. So although 42% of Americans say they, they self-identify as independents and they say they're frustrated with this polarized two-party system, very often they're afraid to vote for anyone other than one of those two candidates because of what we call the, the spoiler argument. So you eliminate that. And then the second thing it does is you end up with somebody who wins an election who always has more than 50%. So you end up with fewer situations where a very vocal, very passionate plurality of either a party in a primary or an election can elect somebody. I think nine out of Maine's last 13 governors have been elected with less than a majority, for example. And then the third and final point is it, it brings in some civility because if Josh and Rebecca and I are all running against each other in an election, I'm not gonna be out there telling the world that Josh and Rebecca are evil and stupid. I'm gonna be saying, you know, Josh and, Josh and I agree on a lot of things. And here are a couple of points where we don't agree. And it, because I want his second place votes. I want his second place votes. I want his supporters to think highly of me. So I'm not gonna be out there demonizing him all the time. So I think in those three important ways, it could really change the dynamic in American elections. Thank you. Rebecca, you served 10 years as a state representative in Utah. Um, I'd be especially interested in your sense, whether you uh, share Neil's um, perspective on how RCV might re-incentivize candidates, but um, what I'd also really like to ask you about is how RCV might re-incentivize our legislative process. I mean, I wonder if you think that if we elected different kinds of candidates in a different way, it might then encourage them to behave in a different way once they're actually in office. Thank you for the, the question, and it was great to hear about Neil's experience because I would say that, especially with the party system that we have, um, here in Utah, we have two pathways. I'll just give a little bit of lay of the land here in Utah. We have two pathways by which individuals can be placed on the ballot. One is through a convention caucus system, and that convention caucus system relies uh, mostly on delegates who are elected at a neighborhood level to go to their party's convention to then elect individuals that will be placed on the ballot to represent their party. A few years ago, Utah passed legislation that allows individuals to also pursue being placed on their party's ballot by signature gathering. So they can get a petition and get signatures and with a certain threshold can be placed on the ballot. That put us in a situation where we had previously, there was always a, a situation that people would pare down through a primary system to a minimum or a maximum of two people in a party's primary. With the signature pathway, there opened the door for more than two people to be placed on a party's primary ballot. Um, this year, we actually had five individuals that were on the GOP gubernatorial ballot. And this year would have been an excellent uh, year for Utah to have used RCV. And I think that we are in a situation presently where there's a strong appetite with the voting public that we need to move in that direction primarily because uh, in the GOP lane because of what happened with the gubernatorial race. And for our Democrats, their frustration that on our primary day, which was Super Tuesday, a number of people that they had voted for using vote by mail ballots were out of the queue. They had withdrawn from the race and people said, well, I just threw that vote away. So we have this really, we have this really interesting situation in Utah presently uh, with that track. Um, and, you know, I think what, what we've seen happen is that this year has been also interesting in that both of our parties, both of our major parties opted to use RCV in that convention caucus system. 
uh, they were presented with a situation with the pandemic of not being able to gather hundreds and thousands of people together, delegates, to do their convention as they usually do. Mostly the two parties would use runoffs to be able to determine, narrow down who would be the person that was presented as the convention candidate. But this year with the pandemic, they're like, we can't pull everybody together. How are we going to do this? And so both parties, um, heartingly so, decided to use RCV uh, remotely. They ran remote virtual conventions and they both selected their convention candidates using RCV, which they found to be a very elegant, a very efficient mechanism to for people to just cast their ballot early in the day and they'd say goodbye i'm out of here <laughs> and not stick around for the full convention um and they were both parties were very pleased with that process um what what i have found well the other thing i'd like to bring up that people don't know about utah is that the gop has actually used instant runoff voting and rank choice voting in previous conventions like 10 years ago, they were using IRV to kind of narrow down their, their cohort of candidates. So it wasn't a process that was this familiar for GOP delegates that have been involved in the party for a number of years. They've used RCV or IRV before. So that wasn't something new. It was something a bit new for Democratic delegates and Democratic voters, but they're seeing where it provides them this opportunity to uh, not feel that their vote has been thrown away. So also the one thing that I wanted to bring up is that within our moving ranked choice voting as a prospective mechanism by which people can cast their ballot in Utah, um, it's been a bipartisan effort because the GOP had used it previously in their conventions, because Democrats uh, in particular um, felt strongly about being able to rank, you know, they always call me and say, I like two of these guys, I can't decide. How am I supposed to decide? Um, I would say, well, help, it, help me promote rank choice voting because it would allow you to rank those individuals. Um, lastly, kind of speaking to what Neil's experience was is that what we're finding here in Utah, and I think that others will probably reinforce this with data and with what we're seeing um, that can be quantified is that people aren't choosing parties. In Utah, um, until recently, our second largest cohort of voters are unaffiliated voters. Um, they're at, they make up more than a third of our voters in this state. And if there's only these two pathways of you've got to do this convention or this closed primary, which is the case of the GOP primary, it's a closed primary, where, where do unaffiliated voters sit? How are they able to articulate their voice and to participate and to be heard and be represented. So um, as, as an elected official, my district was pretty packed um, and that's a discussion for the, the need for reform and redistricting, but I have a packed district. Uh, so predominantly it's a very progressive liberal district, but I always really tried to listen to those that weren't my base, that didn't necessary, necessarily vote for me. And as I've worked on the variety of pieces of elections reform that I've worked on, which is whether it's election day voter registration um, or uh, vote centers or whatever, I've always been thinking about those unaffiliated voters that just don't have a voice in this system, this partisan system. Um, so I've tried to be more responsive and I think RCV allows for, um, for people to really be represented and for the consensus voice to be the voice of the governed. Thank you. Um, let me turn to Josh, um, especially since I think you've brought up a couple of really interesting points in there about um, a, a wasted mail-in votes in the middle of a, um, of a presidential campaign, people voting for, for candidates who've been removed from the ballot and the cracking and packing of districts. Um, I mean, Josh, what we've seen in this presidential campaign, and I think increasingly in the years leading up to this, is just how politicized these issues of electoral reform have become, whether it's in state legislatures in, in that kind of aggressive redistricting that's been done by both parties, whether it's on the president's Twitter feed. Um, I'd love it if you could kind of pull us up to the uh, professorial uh, 30,000 foot view. Um, could you give us a sense of how a ranked choice voting might strengthen democracy and improve the way we think about the idea of representation. Sure. 
Thanks, David. And first, before I answer, it's, I feel like, you know, in the presidential debates, they never actually answer the first question. They first say thank you to the hosts and all that. So I want to make sure I get that in uh, to thank you and uh, Fair Vote and my co-panelists. Um, and by the way, uh, Dave graciously mentioned the books by, by Neil and by me, but he's got two excellent books about, uh, about democracy reform that you should also check out. Um, so, you know, I think about first our founding principles and our founding documents. And, you know, one thing that the Declaration of Independence says is that we should be con have the consent of the governed. What does that mean right now at the Declaration of Independence time, the governed was everybody, but the consent was only white male property owners. Uh, and we've gone through this project through over the years of uh, expanding who can vote and who can participate. Now it's full of fits and starts, right? And it's certainly not perfect. Uh, and yet there's an evolution that we see of ever more inclusiveness. And I see ranked choice voting as kind of part of that project toward greater inclusiveness in our democracy, because what it does is it allows people who otherwise feel like they have a wasted vote, vote or their vote won't count to actually have a say in, in you know, who, who becomes uh, our elected officials and have a say in who can be the consent of the governed. Um, you know, in my, in my book, Vote for Us, uh, which I have right here, by the way, it looks like that, uh, the chapter on ranked choice voting, I start by saying I love ice cream. I do love ice cream. And my favorite flavor is mint chocolate chip. But when I go to the ice cream shop, if they're out of mint chocolate chip, I don't just sulk away and not have ice cream, right? That would be crazy. I go to my second choice. We all have preferences. And why should I not get ice cream as opposed to get my second choice, even if my first choice uh, is no longer available? And in reimagining what we mean by the consent of the governed, I think we have to take both a macro view in terms of our overall constitutional democracy and uh, a more localized view. Because what we see in lots of ways in which we've expanded participation is that localities typically act first in whatever it is. So, you know, we're celebrating the 100th uh, anniversary of the 19th Amendment in women's suffrage. That started as a local movement. And in fact, many localities and so several states allowed women to vote in school board elections uh, or in local elections before eventually being allowed to vote in all elections through the 19th Amendment. And it really took that local push, that local drive for greater inclusivity, for greater, a greater sense of the consent of the governed. And we see that with ranked choice voting as well. You know, we did, you, we used to use ranked choice voting or reform of it decades ago in cities like Cincinnati, uh, but then it fell out of, out of use. And then it kind of came back uh, really starting in 2002 in San Francisco. And in many ways, it was thanks to a single individual who basically decided, you know, we should find a new way to incorporate more people into our democracy to create the consent of the governed uh, and started advocating on the ground. And, you know, he would go to bars and say, let's all rank our favorite beers to demonstrate how everyone has preferences. And it's not, not that hard. And so, you know, I think when you, know, you ask how can it change from the, from the 30,000 foot level, you know, I think what we have to think about our, our, our founding documents and that concept, what does it mean to have a fundamental right to vote? You know, there's so many aspects, uh, Rebecca mentioned redistricting. You know, we can talk about voter registration issues. We can talk about who can vote election day, mail-in voting, uh, all these issues that go towards the project that really means the consent of the government. And ranked choice voting is part and parcel of that because what it does is it, it create it changes the incentive structures, as Neil was mentioning. It changes the scope of the campaign. Uh, it perhaps changes the way that legislators operate, as Rebecca mentioned. But I also think it changes the voters' incentives to actually show up. Because what's what do we ultimately want? We ultimately want the greatest participation possible because our government, our democracy, is only as good as those who participate in it by showing up and voting. And ranked choice voting has all of the various virtues and benefits, but it also leads to greater participation because people feel like their voice does actually matter. So when you ask me, ask me for my kind of academic professorial view, it's at the 30,000 foot level about that founding declaration, that founding concept, but it's also about the ground level effects 
of getting this passed in various communities and then it can spread as it already has been spreading. I am ready to vote for us. I'm ready to vote for both of you. I mean, this, this, this is inspiring. You guys are terrific. Um, um, once again, I want to remind everybody that you can leave your questions in the Q&A or the chat box uh, below, and we'll get to them in just a few minutes. I just want to go around this amazing group one more time and maybe zero in on some of the uh, specific places where ranked choice voting might um, uh, transform our elections, um, where it might have the greatest impact, and then we'll move on to all of your questions. Um, Neil, uh, your book zeroes in on this extreme binary trap that our politics in so many ways has kind of found ourselves caught in. You've got candidates representing bases of both parties. They're elected in low turnout primaries, and then they're running in uncompetitive districts weighted to one side or the other. Um, I'm wondering what you think about ranked choice voting in party primaries and how that might help. Um, and then what might be different if we enacted the Fair Representation Act nationally and elected the U.S. House with ranked choice voting from larger multi-member districts? Sure. So first, with the primaries, because we have these systems where the person with the most votes wins, regardless of if there were seven candidates and they got 28 percent and that was the most they still win when you have a system like that it enables a small passionate plurality to take control of that election and i think we see that within both party primaries right we saw that in the 2016 republican primary i don't think trump got more than 40 percent in the first dozen or more primaries. And I'm not sure he was the second choice for a lot of those primary voters. But because everyone can only cast one ballot, and that's the way the system works, he wins. And then we almost saw it in the Democratic primary this cycle. I think Bernie Sanders, who we're, we're all forgetting, but right up until Super Tuesday, everyone thought he was going to win. And it would have been another example of a small, passionate plurality winning that election. And then because we have this two party system, whoever wins those primaries, all of a sudden is one of two viable candidates to, to win the election. So having ranked choice voting in primaries eliminates that, that dynamic where these small passionate pluralities can take control of the primary. The Fair Representation Act, which Dave knows well, was um, written by Congressman Don Beyer uh, a couple of years ago, combines having ranked choice voting for congressional districts with having multi-member districts. So having congressional districts of up to five representatives. So in a state like mine in Maryland, where we have eight house districts, we'd have two districts of four each. And in any state with five members or less, you just have one district where you collectively elect those one, two, three, four, or five representatives. And then in larger states, California, New York, you'd have multiple districts with up to five members each. So that accomplishes something else. Because right now, imagine you're a Republican who lives on East 63rd Street in Manhattan, right? Or you're a Democrat who lives in Stevensville, Texas. You really feel like you have no representation. But if you were part of a bigger district with five representatives, you could cast the vote for who you thought. And of those five representatives representing the, the Upper East Side of Manhattan, you know, probably one would be a Republican. Um, and the same thing would happen in Texas in the reverse way. And it also would give a better opportunity for third party and independent candidates. So just, just think about it. I think, what is it, one or 2% of this country um, are registered libertarians, one or 2% are in the Green Party. Out of 535 members of Congress, each of those parties should have, say, 10 representatives. Right now, they have none because of this kind of winner take all single member district system. So, um, so I think the Fair Representation Act could do a lot to give people representation who right now aren't represented. It would do all the things I talked about before, changing the dynamics in the election. And it probably would do more than anything to get us out of this vicious spiral of polarization and partisanship that we're tired of. Um, I'll just close with one thought, and this is a little risky speaking right after a political scientist. Um, but in the 1950s, there was a guy, Maurice Duverger, a French political scientist, who 
determined that in systems like ours, in systems with single member congressional districts or single member legislative districts and winner take all elections, you inevitably end up with a two party system and that inevitably it becomes more and more polarized. And so unless we do something about it, it's just going to get worse and worse. And ranked choice voting and the Fair Representation Act in particular would, would do more than anything I can think of to address that downward spiral that we're in. Josh, we are heading towards a 2024 cycle that, that could have open, uh, open presidential seats on both sides. You could have a contest on the Democratic and the Republican side in 2024 under, under lots of different circumstances. Um, we had those record fields that Neil was talking about in 2016 on the Republican side and in 2020 on the Democratic side. Have you been thinking about reforms that might play into um, a, a fairer a presidential nomination process in 2024? And where would ranked choice voting fit amongst, amongst those ideas? Yeah, I mean, there's so there's lots of reforms that I'd love to see both in the short term and the long term. Um, and ranked choice voting, I think, certainly could help the presidential nomination process for the very reason that you mentioned in your, I think it was in your introduction, uh, when you explained how you know you had all of these basically wasted votes of people who who voted early uh, through mail-in balloting and then their candidate of choice dropped out. Uh, and if you had a ranked choice ballot for the presidential contest, uh, then if a candidate drops out of the race, your second choice would still make a difference uh, in that particular state's primary. But I have to be honest that I think the prospect and the, uh, the, the hope for ranked choice voting is actually better at the local level still. And so proponents of this reform should focus more on state and local adoption than for the presidential election. You know, I could list off a whole slew of reforms that I think are, are more viable uh, to actually pass for uh, the 2024 presidential election season and perhaps would have a, a greater impact. Uh, and those all would be about kind of who can vote. Uh, we can talk about open versus closed primaries. Uh, we can talk about you know, reforms uh, both on the judicial side with courts recognizing the power of state constitutions and what, they're, uh, what they say about protecting the right to vote, invoking those to ensure that our process is more open for people to participate. I think those could have a greater impact uh, in the presidential election process. I also think just the prospect of having ranked choice voting pass for presidential elections is much harder even in the span of four years without a lot of success, a lot more success stories uh, among localities and other states. Uh, but what we see with ranked choice voting is that, you know, it, uh, it started the modern era, as I mentioned earlier, started in San Francisco, then it started to spread uh, to lots of other places, Portland, uh, Maine, uh, the Twin Cities, uh, and now you had enough support that it went statewide in Maine as well. Uh, and now we've only had, I think, what, one congressional election with ranked choice voting uh, in Maine. So well, I think we need to see additional elections statewide and then additional states pass ranked choice voting for their uh, state elections and maybe congressional elections um, before you'd actually see real changes for the presidential primary process. Um, again, you, you know, so, so one thing I've talked about in my scholarship is uh, this concept of uh, local control and, lo and local ability to make changes. There's a Supreme Court Justice uh, Louis Brandeis who once wrote that states can be laboratories of democracy, that one courageous state can try something new and if it works well, it can spread to other places. And I like to say that if states are laboratories of democracy, then cities and counties can be test tubes of democracy that try things out on an even smaller scale and they'll work, they'll spread to other states uh, and then eventually have statewide adoption. And that's, I think, what we're seeing with a lot of reforms, including ranked choice voting. And, and we're at the precipice where more and more cities and counties are adopting uh, it for their local elections. We need to convince state legislators to give uh, the, their cities and, count and counties home, what's called home rule, or basically local control over their local elections. Uh, that project, I think, uh, can lead toward a longer term reform for our presidential primary process as well.
Rebecca, um, the polarization that Neil and Josh have been talking about, it, it just, it seems so difficult to defeat. I mean, there's the, there's the famous Jerry Seinfeld joke about how when we root for baseball teams, we're really just rooting for a jersey for, for laundry. And you've got so many Americans who are rooting for sort of team red, for a team blue, and we've lost the ability to even talk to one another. Um, there's not a single reform that can go ahead and fix this. And it's all so reinforced by by partisan media, by social media, by complex uh, uh, cultural identity questions. Um, but in Utah, Republicans, conservatives, a lot of Democrats, very much on board with RCV. You've got a governor who said kind things about it. You have worked across the aisle with Republican lawmakers on, on RCV bills during your tenure in the House. Um, what have you found that Republicans like about this fix? And what do you think that says about perhaps the power of RCV to maybe bridge some of these divides in our politics? Well, as I mentioned initially that, you know, the GOP here in Utah was familiar with RCV at their local level. So, I mean, in terms of their party elections. So very familiar with it. And in fact, um, my colleague, Representative Mark Roberts, who is very, very conservative, almost toward the libertarian end of the ideological spectrum. And then myself, we're the ones that were the two co-sponsors of our legislation here in Utah. Um, so there, for him, it was a, the plurality issue. He just really felt very strongly about the fact that individuals shouldn't be elected by less than the majority. Just felt really strongly about that. For me, it was, you know, the options about, you know, if you liked a group of, of a candidates and you just couldn't make that decision, you wanted your voice to count, you want your vote to count. And as I mentioned earlier, where do those unaffiliated voters fit in the whole scheme of things? I wanted to dovetail a bit on what Josh said about uh, things starting at a local level. So, you know, when I ran my bill in 2017, I made it very all-encompassing, a general RCV for all levels of, the, of elections and everybody just kind of freaked out. It's like, oh my gosh, what is she doing? But when you do that, then you can kind of bring people to the table and say, well, if you don't want it for all elections, why don't we start it as a municipal pilot? Let's, let's let those cities give this a try. Let's test it out. It's just like Joseph. Let's let them be those test tubes to figure that out. And so in 2018, Mark Roberts ran that municipal pilot program and so we were able to get that. So it was permissive for cities at their own at their own level. The city council has to vote. Mayor has to support uh, moving forward in that direction, passing a resolution saying that they're intending to run RCV elections. Biggest challenge we've run to here in Utah is that our clerks, the elections administrator, the county clerks, there's only one that's willing to do the RCV um, administration. The others do not want to. So there's a bit of a... Um, firewall that we're running into that we're working on, that it really takes all of those constituents at the city level, the county level, um, statewide to say, no, this is the way we want to do things. We want to change. And with the one, one county clerk in Utah County that said she'd be willing to do that, you had two cities last year with the municipal pilot in 2019 that gave it a try. Both Vineyard and Payson cities did it. I noticed somebody posed a question on polling. We polled voters and candidates in those two cities that were a part of that municipal project last year, and well over 80% of candidates and voters said they were very pleased with utilizing RCV last year, and they want their system to change. They want to do this from here on out. And so I think that that was the momentum that we need, and oftentimes when you start things at a local level, when you start things with pilot programs, you can kind of get people used to it. You get them warmed up to the ideas Josh mentioned, and once they start getting used to using it, it's like, well, then now we've had this discussion about why, why didn't we use that for the gubernatorial primary? And then the Democrats saying, why didn't we use that for our Democratic primary, Wyoming and Hawaii did. So once they start test driving it, and once they see other states and other local communities using it with success, then it turns into, why aren't we doing it? And then they start putting pressure on their local electeds, those city councils and those county councils to try it and then state legislatures to make it permissive within statutory authority to do it, which is what we did in 2018. We've and it just, I think that it just, in terms of the partisan issue, it just, um, one thing that I just bring up, you saw it happen immediately with the GOP convention when they used RCV. They didn't use it for primary, they used it for the convention and you started to see flyers being mailed to the delegates saying, well, 
you know, if you don't pick me as your first person, I hope that you'll look, they would put sample ballots on the back of, you know, pick me second or pick me third. And for it to happen that immediately, just with them being using it, the convention system, and then you saw the vitriol flip back when the primary season began because they weren't using RCB and then the attacks began. It was just very uh, eye-opening and startling how people pivot to the format of the game, knowing what they have to do one way or the other. That's the incentive structure we were talking about, absolutely. Um, there's a really good question um, about how we move forward on on enacting RCB given given all of all of the politics of the situation um, and and Josh and Rebecca um, you both talked about kind of a a, a bottom up system um, Neil I wonder if you agree with that or if your sense is um, based on the urgency uh, of the structural reforms as you write in your book if if y y you would advocate for a a bigger faster uh, a form of change i'm guessing all of us would love to see the fair representation act passed tomorrow right and to see this kind of top down national change um and i wish i thought that there was a real possibility that that could happen. I think it's gonna it's gonna take some things to happen in advance of that in order to to make that happen. And I, I really agree with Josh and Rebecca that the number one thing that could help us pass this at a national level is getting momentum at the local level and getting people comfortable in municipal elections and statewide elections and the congressional races in Maine, seeing that it works, seeing that it does produce a different type of election and different type of election results, and then. With that momentum, hopefully we'd be able to pass something that has more national scope. We turn to some of, of these really good questions here. Um, there are people who are interested in a national voting rights amendment to the Constitution. Um, perhaps maybe starting with Josh, Rebecca, and, and Neil, um, um, would you uh, share you, your thoughts on the role of a voting rights amendment to ensure that there is a constitutional right to vote? Yeah, that's a great question and something that I've worked on and, and, and thought about a lot uh, so far in my, my studies on election law and voting rights. Um, so the US Constitution protects the, vote, the right to vote, but uh, only through the Equal Protection Clause. It's essentially the US Supreme Court has interpreted the Equal Protection Clause uh, to require equality in voting. And then there's a handful of amendments that say that states cannot deny the right to vote on the basis of certain characteristics, uh, race, a, uh, sex, inability to pay a poll tax, and age. And, and as I mentioned, though, uh, almost every state constitution affirmatively grants the right to vote to the state citizens. So the state constitutions have language like all citizens of the state shall be qualified voters, uh, et cetera. Um, so the question is, would a right to vote amendment be more robust like those state constitutions? And, and how could we write one in such a way that the US Supreme Court would not too narrowly construe it? Because that's the real problem is that you have a, you know, decades now of Supreme Court jurisprudence, which has too narrowly construed that equal protection clause to not provide enough protection. And so, you know, the key is what would the language say? I'm fully in support of a constitutional amendment to the US Constitution uh, to, to, you know, more robustly protect the right to vote, but it has to be crafted in such a way that would ensure the US Supreme Court can't basically toss it aside and, and apply the same type of case law that it has for the Equal Protection Clause. But I do encourage uh, you all to think about and look into what the state constitutions in your state says uh, and encourage state judges to robustly protect the state constitutional right to vote because those by their terms, by their very language, are more robust or more protective of the right to vote uh, than the U.S. Constitution. And so some lawyers have had very a lot of success challenging things like voter ID requirements under state constitutions saying, look, our language goes beyond the U.S. Constitution. So you don't have to follow the U.S. Supreme Court case law on the right to vote, you can craft a uh, case law at the state level under the state constitution that is more robust. Rebecca, Neil, did you have yeah. any 
Jump, I, jump yeah, what I would speak to, I mean, I don't know exactly how it would be, would be framed, but I'll tell you one of the challenges I've run into in running elections reform legislation at the state level here in Utah, because we don't have anything enshrined in our US Constitution that really expressly says that citizens have a right to vote. Um, I, I remember when I was trying to run my election day voter registration bill, um, that a lot of the pushback that I got was in regards to, well, how do we know if people are educated voters? If they, you know, that the, there was this really clear prism that many of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle saw through that, that voting is a privilege, not a right, and that you have to earn it. Um, and you earn it by, yeah, for a, in a variety of ways. One of them being knowing how to register to vote and catch, checking up on your registration and making sure that it hasn't been, um, that it was a, a sign that you know that you're on the rolls and everything like that and so th that was one area that I really I mean, we just that was a sticking point for us I see voting as a right they saw it as a privilege that needed to be earned and I think that really enshrining voting as a right for citizens within the constitution even as basic as that would for me open a lot of doors for some of these reforms and provide um, the courts that um, litmus tests by which they can kind of look through some of the various pieces of legislation that are often imposed and passed at a local level that impede individuals right to vote. Um, again, I don't have a, a deep legal background, but just at the basic, basic level of what I ran into when I was trying to run legislation here, uh, to open doors, to take down walls, uh, to really allow voters as much access as possible to the ballot box. Um, that was the one thing I ran into is this very clear distinction of perspective of voting being a right versus a privilege. We have a couple of really good questions on the partisanship and politicization of, of election reform, of RCV in general. Do you all have advice and thoughts on how we keep these issues of a democracy to be values and ideals that we can all get behind even in the midst of such a polarized and politicized a political environment? Well, let, let me piggyback on something that Rebecca just said that I think uh, ties to this question as well, which is anyone who is, is touting that the line of voting is a privilege is a, uh, instead of a right, simply wants to suppress the votes of those who they think are not going to vote for their side. I mean, it is, it is a, a political trope that has zero relevance in the uh, understanding of what a democracy is. There's, you know, you can also bring in that we live in a republic, not a democracy. Those two things are exactly the same when it comes to the way in which our governmental structure exists. I mean, no one truly wants a democracy in the, the purely theoretical form of the term, which is that everyone has to vote on every single issue whatsoever. We have a representative democracy and we've always had a representative democracy and voting has always been a right to those to whom we grant it to as a society. And it, it again was, you know, sim simply white male property owners at the founding, but no one suggested that those individuals once we decided they were of the right characteristics to enjoy voting, uh, it had to jump through any additional hoops. Uh, they had to uh, demonstrate that they had earned this so-called privilege. So I think one thing we do have to do is push back against that completely false notion of this concept that someone has to do something to, to earn the, the right. The second thing I think we have to do is that it is true that ranked choice voting and a lot of other pro-voting reforms have been enjoyed more by or, or, or supported more by one political party over the other. But there are good government individuals on the other side as well. And we need to promote them as much as possible to champion and demonstrate how we're working across the aisle. Kentucky, my state, uh, just came out with a great plan for voting for the November election, a bipartisan agreement between the Democratic governor and the Republican Secretary of State. And I'll be the first to say that our Republican Secretary of State is a voting rights champion in the way in which he's approached many of these issues. At the same time, he's also promoted a voter ID law, which I oppose, uh, 
But in the grand scheme of things, uh, he listened with respect to that voter ID law, he listened and, and, and agreed with meaningful changes to the law to ease the burdens. And in a macro level, he has been a voting rights champion because he wants to protect democracy. And I think we need to promote and tout individuals like that to demonstrate that you're either pro-democracy or you're anti-democracy. Which one do you want to be on? Which side do you want to be on? If, um, I'll chime in. So I think if we want these reforms to be passed on a bipartisan basis, which by the way is critically important, if you want them to be lasting and to have buy-in from the whole American public and to have them not viewed as a tool that one party used to change the rules of elections to their benefit, which I think is super important, right, that we pass them on a bipartisan basis. If you, if you want to do that, I think the key is coupling reforms that have a benefit perceived or real, because sometimes the perceptions are not reality, right, that have a be benefit perceived or real for one party with reforms that have a benefit perceived or real with the other party. Um, it is no coincidence that, you know, what are obvious examples like DC statehood, Re Democrats favor it, Republicans are overwhelmingly against it. There's a lot of partisan motivation there. But at the same time, you know, the voices that are calling for redoing the way we, we um, count the electoral college or have representation in a, right now, you know, because of the Senate, small states have more representation than they would be due if it was purely based on population. Those voices tend to be 99% Democrat. And, and those aren't great examples of things that we actually want to get done. But you, you need, in the reform world, if it is the perception or reality that ranked choice voting would benefit Democrats more, then I think we should think a lot about coupling it with other things, like open primaries, for example. The Democrats have more states where their primaries are closed, closed to independent voters, or um, have stricter rules about when you need to register for a prim primary in order to vote in there, couple some changes to how that system works with changes that would benefit the party. And I think that's how you form a bipartisan coalition to get stuff done. There's a great example on the Hill now, um, American Promise, another reform organization that's very involved with campaign finance reform, is coupling some of their efforts with a term limits amendment. So campaign finance reform generally supported more by Democrats, term limits generally supported more by Republicans, but by coupling them together, I think you, you do a lot to make it more bipartisan and potentially more lasting and impactful. You're well, our legislator, I, oh, Rebecca, oh, okay, Tickers in the Utah House. I'd love to hear you on this as well. So, you know, just uh, piggybacking on what Neil mentioned about finding what appeals to the folks on the other side of the aisle. Um, the county that is using RCV for cities that choose it, um, the, it is a very, very conservative, very Republican uh, county. And the clerk, very, very conservative Republican clerk. But the way she looks at it is RCV is better, faster, and cheaper. And she has been pounding that as her motto to um, encourage, you know, encourage their, their constituencies and their localities to look at this. And with uh, the two cities that pursued it, I think Vineyard in particular, they didn't want to have to pay for both the primary and for a general election. They didn't want to have to fuss with having to do a runoff and having to pay for that. And they, the, the communities there looked at it very much through an efficiencies uh, prism of, you know, we just need to do the election once, um, we run it through the tabulator, it's done. And the efficiencies and the cost savings was really something that they, uh, that appealed to that particular group of individuals. And again, she, that's the thing she says all the time when she's trying to convince other local elections officials, especially those that are Republican, it's better, faster, cheaper. Let's just do it. It's easy. We did it. There, you know, we've got 80% of the people that participated that enjoyed it. So it's about looking at it what, as to what appeals to um, kind of the, the underpinning of that particular constituency. Reinventing that lost art of persuasion and trying to bring people to your side through the arguments that are likely to appeal to them. Absolutely. Um, I've got time for a couple more questions down here. Um, we have an election law professor on the panel, so I'm going to throw this one out. Uh, uh, Josh, are there constitutional barriers to ranked choice voting? No, 
Um, there was one problem under the Maine Constitution with uh, the way in which Maine initially passed ranked choice voting in terms of uh, the Maine Constitution required a majority winner for some of their elections. Uh, if, if the question is about can Congress pass ranked choice voting and mandate it for congressional elections, absolutely Congress can. What the US Constitution says is that uh, states have the first cut, essentially, at running uh, elections for Congress, but that Congress can, quote, alter or amend those regulations. And so this is why Congress has the power to enact various rules, such as the Voting Rights Act uh, or the National Voter Registration Act, often referred to as the Motor Voter Law. Uh, states have the first ability to uh, change to, uh, to, to first ability to, to craft their election rules as they see fit. But again, Congress has constitutional authority to decide that it wants a different rule for the way in which uh, congressional elections are run. Again, there may be some state constitutional amendments in certain or state constitutional problems in certain states like we saw in Maine. Um, but I think those are fairly minimal and Maine was still able to successfully have ranked choice voting for congressional elections. Uh, uh, still consistent with the, the state constitution. We have a question on the kind of resistance that you sometimes hear from RCV about everyday voters and how you respond to it. Josh, we heard your response about ice cream, which um, I wholeheartedly endorse, um, especially in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, there's been too much ice cream um, and it has not mattered which flavor. Um, Rebecca, as you work with legislators um, and you're pushing ranked choice voting, what what do, do you hear as far as objections and how do you counter those? I think the one that resonates, not resonates, that, that kind of continues to rear its ugly head every time we start to move things forward, although we've had really great success over the last couple of years. And I, I do think that goes to the fact that the GOP was using it locally and they are a super majority in, in the state. Um, and actually, when I was trying to run it my first year, our Democrats were very unfamiliar with it. And when they heard that the GOP had been using it in their uh, conventions, they're like, what are you doing? What is this new thing that you're carting out? Or that they were really perplexed and trying to figure out what's the, you know, what's the backstory? Why do the Republicans like it? You know, we don't want to support it. And so it took a little bit of persuading, but there were a number of folks on the progressive side of our, of our party that were real devotees of, of RCV. So there was that. The one that I keep hearing frequently is this, the notion of the one person, one vote, and that it takes away from the one person, one vote. Uh, and I'm noticing that the, what happened with Maine uh, just in the last couple of days, it continues to be their argument. Uh, but we have a few, we have a very, we have a few very staunch folks on the conservative side that are really suspect uh, or suspicious of RCV and they, they cart that, that pony out every once in a while as to, you know, it's not really one person, one vote. Uh, you're giving people a second chance. Um, and so I would say that's probably the one that I hear most frequently. And the other one that the clerks keep bringing up, which really kind of irritates me is that people won't understand how to do it. You're gonna have to spend a whole bunch of money educating individuals on how to do it. And I think that our case studies, our pilot in um, Vineyard and Payson disproved that. I think they got one call or one complaint from one voter and everybody else just loved it. So there's those, those are the two. And let me just add that the one person, one vote argument is, uh, is just not a strong constitutional argument. That doctrine comes from redistricting law where basically every district that uh, is, is drawn to create different districts has to have equal population. Uh, in ranked choice voting, one vote gets counted for every ballot. It just might not be the first choice on the ballot. It might be the second. And every court that has faced that one person, one vote type challenge has wholeheartedly rejected it. I'm sorry, I was muted there for a moment. Um, Neil, um, how have you addressed those uh, kinds of opposition arguments that you've heard to RCV, you, you have such a, a good, clear way of framing all of this. I wonder if people say it's too complicated, what's your, your response? You know, I have 10 reforms in my book and they're all supported by at least 60% of Americans and, and the most popular ones are in the 80s. Uh, 
rank choice voting is generally in the 60s when people understand what it is, meaning that in the 60% of Americans support it. I think the issue, I, I, I don't come across, at least, you know, I'm not in the political science universe the way Josh is, where I'm talking to academics about this. And so I don't come across the one voter, one vote issue. The issue I kind of come across with, which kind of everyday citizens is, it just feels complicated and it's new and it's different. And humans generally don't like change. And this is, we're asking them to change something that they're used to and that we've done a certain way for a long time. And so I think the way around that is just education, 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 and explaining some of the things you were talking about, Dave, that listen, this isn't that complicated. It's exactly what it sounds like. You have multiple candidates, just rank them. It's not that complicated. Right, we all do this every day, as, as Josh was pointing out with his um, ice cream analogy. Although I like, personally, when I go to the ice cream shop, I get more than one flavor. So, you know, I guess I'm kind of having my cake and eating it too. But, um, but the- That's a nice metaphor. If it, yeah, I blew that metaphor, the cake <laughs> and the ice cream didn't really work, right? But, um, but my point is, I think the issue for real Americans with this is more about the complexity than about the law. And I think the way over that is through education and letting them know what it is and giving them examples. You know, Josh's ice cream example is actually a great example. And, and I think that's the, the challenge. David, if I could step back really quickly just to dovetail on that as to where I see the most pushback from, like I mentioned, it's mostly from my colleagues in the legislature, a few, not all of them, is politicians and candidates, we know how to game the system that it is. We know the process. We know what we need to do. We know the hurdles that need to be, we need to leap through. And with this, because it's new, it's like, okay, so how am I supposed to, how am I supposed to do an election? How am I supposed to do a campaign? And so I think that the pushback is more about, I know how to win this way. And this is putting me in a position that I don't know how I'm going to, how I'm going to win, you know? And so I think that's more of a, the familiarity, but not just a familiarity or a, a hesitancy to change on the part of candidates and incumbents. It's more about, I know how to game this system. I know how to use it to my advantage. And with RCV, the advantage isn't to the incumbent and it's not to the candidate, it's to the voter. And that's very, that is turning, that it takes us back to the very beginning of this discussion. It's turning elections and how we've done campaigning and who's in charge on its head. And it's bringing us, us back to the idea of the consent of the governed and putting this back in the hands of the people, which I think is a wonderful place to end what has been um, a really fascinating and inspiring conversation. My thanks to Neil, to Josh, to Rebecca. Um, I want to plug their books once again. Uh, uh, Josh's book, Vote for Us, How to Take Back Our Elections and Change the Future of Voting. Neil's book, The Contract to Unite America, 10 Reforms to Reclaim Our Republic. I would love to see you all back here at noon uh, on September 15th, when we will have Daniel Newman uh, and Catherine Geale as our guests. Um, and then again on noon on October 1st, uh, when we'll have Professor Danielle Allen from Harvard University. Um, and then on our Twitter and Facebook and Instagrams, you will see all of our future events on this. Um, my thanks once again to all of you for uh, joining us and to this terrific panel. Um, and we thank you very much for your support and your interest in fair vote and ranked choice voting. Thanks everybody. <laughs>